We're glad you joined us again. We're going to be looking at another great man that we call the Apostle of Faith named Smith Wigglesworth. He's been one of my personal favorites for many years, hearing stories from people who knew him, uh, interviewing those who were family members. I had the honor of doing that when I was in South Africa just a few years ago. But I think the best way to start this particular hour is to go to a man by the name of Lester Semerall who knew him personally and was able to spend time with him. And we're going to start this hour with him telling a story about how Wigglesworth prayed for a man that needed healing. My relationship began with him uh, when I was 20 years old, and not with my meeting him, but hearing of him. I was in, in San Francisco uh, preaching, and uh, to start my trip around the world, they said, have you met Smith Wigglesworth from England? I said, no, not yet. They said he was here, and, and they, they told me a number of the things that happened, but I will only tell you one. They, that right there in the same church where I was preaching, the great Glad Tidings Tabernacle that at that time seated more than 3,000 people. It says he was here speaking, and on a Sunday afternoon, he had a healing service. And, and that, uh, that they brought the people from hospitals and wheelchairs and all kinds of situations for Smith Wigglesworth to pray for them. And from one of the local hospitals, the doctor brought a very severe cancer case. They didn't want to bring him because he was so near death. The doctor accompanied him and sat by his little, little portable hospital bed on the platform. And here came Smith Wigglesworth, who was just a little bit gruff, uh, down the line praying for the people. And the way he would ask you what was wrong with you, he'd say, Hootsoop. Now, in his part of England, that was a similar way to their speaking. Hootsoop means uh, what ailed you or what, what is wrong with you. And so he got to this patient that was laying out on a bed uh, there and, and, and had on one of the little hospital gowns, you know, that has no buttons, in, uh, buttons up in the back. There was a doctor sitting there uh, with his uh, stethoscopes in his ears and listening to the man's heart beat and, 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 and letting everybody know that he was, the man was very near death. And so when Smith Wiggles got and said, what's up? The doctor replied and said he is dying of cancer. And Wigglesworth said, where is it? And the, the doctor said, in his stomach. And, and Smith Wigglesworth, possibly the most unusual person that I've ever met in my life, he wound up his hand and hit him where the cancer was in the stomach. Punched him so hard until the man died. Just like, just his hands fell uh, off, the, off the bed and, and the doctor screamed, he's dead, he's dead. And he looked up and said, you killed him. You killed him. The family will sue you. You killed him. Smith Wigglesworth wasn't upset one bit. He said, he's healed. And that's the way he would say, you are healed. He says, he's healed. He, he didn't, you know, he didn't pronounce H's. He said, he's healed. And he didn't stop, you know. He just went on down the line praying. About 10 minutes later down the line, here came the man walking. He'd gotten up off that bed, he'd moved the doctor to one side, and he was walking in that, in that funny little hospital dress, you know, that comes along here like this, and is open in the back. And, and here he was following Smith Wigglesworth with his hands in his, uh, up in the air, praising God. He said, I have no pain. I feel wonderful inside. I have energy that I had not had for I don't know how long. And he was following him. And, and Smith Wigglesworth is so unusual. He didn't turn around and say, well, thank God, oh, praise God, everybody look at it. To him, it was such a usual thing. He said, well, just thank God for it. And he just went on praying for people. Wigglesworth's life began June the 10th, 1859. He was born in Yorkshire, England. He's one of the great British ministers and one of the Pentecostal pioneers for England as well as for America and Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. He's been credited as a man that brought Pentecostalism to the great nation of Australia and the beautiful country of New Zealand. He came to America many times on his travels, but he lived most of his life and had his residence in the great nation of England. As a childhood, Wigglesworth said he remembered himself coming from a very extremely poor family, and I think you can understand that because at the age of six, his 
his parents allowed him to begin to work in the fields pulling up turnips uh, to help make money for the family. At the age of seven, he began to work six full days, 12 to 14 hours each day, in the woolen mill with his father, making about 75 cents a day. So I'd have to say that he was a, a man that wasn't scared of work and had to work from a very young age uh, to help provide um, the money that was needed to keep the family afloat and functioning. At the age of eight, his grandmother took him to a Wesleyan meeting to, to help him become a, a Christian, know more about the Lord. In that service that night, he began to see his Wesleyan grandmother shout around the room. I remember reading the story about him that his, saw his grandmother shout around the stove in the middle of the little church where they went because that was the only little stove that kept everybody warm, so they all kind of huddled around it. But he said when the power of God began to come, his grandmother began to shout and run around the room. In those days, it seemed that Methodists had a little more of a shouting spell than they do today. But uh, September the 5th, 1872, is when he experienced a strong presence of God for several days of his life and credits it as a beginning of a moving within his heart toward the things of God of his own personal will and choice. You know, many times you can be carried along as a baby in Christ or as your parents can carry you or a good friend can carry you, but there comes a day when you must have your own experience with the Lord and he began at that time to feel this movement in his heart and begin to go on his own will and his own pursuits for the things of God. At the age of 13, he moved from Yorkshire to the city of Bradford where he lived the rest of his life. Wigglesworth uh, has actually been, uh, lived all of his life there, had his family there. He also is buried there in the beautiful city of Bradford. I was able to visit it a few years ago, and I would say it was a lovely place to live there in Great Britain. At the age of 16, Smith Wigglesworth began to work for the, the wonderful Salvation Army. In today's world, we only know the Salvation Army as people that are possibly in front of our department stores and our grocery stores, especially at Christmas time, ringing bells, taking up collections to help the hungry and the needy. But in the days when it first began, it happened to be one of the greatest uh, spearheads for world evangelism in the world. General Booth is probably someone we should have also probably had an hour teaching on to educate this generation on the great ministry of General Booth, his wife, and his family. Both uh, Wigglesworth and his wife began their early Christian service working for the Salvation Army. Uh, the Salvation Army began like this. I think I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the beginning so you can understand the great power that it had and how wonderful it was to be a part of it, especially, I believe, the evangelism side probably helped Wigglesworth and his whole life in ministry. Uh, General Booth was a member of a nice church in, in Great Britain, and the pastor wanted the church to grow. So he told the members of the church to go out and bring new people in, their friends and different ones from the community. And so the members began to bring people in, new businessmen, you know, the store owners, the different types of what you call affluent people in that particular community. General Booth, though, decided he would come and start bringing people that he thought really needed the Lord, the people that were lived on the streets, the people that were in the poor neighborhoods, and he began to bring them to church, but they were not churched people. So what do I mean by that? They did not know how uh, to function in a church service. So they would talk to the preacher, talk among themselves out loud. Some would be drinking, some would be eating, and they'd be sitting there, and they didn't smell quite right. They didn't dress right. They didn't have the clothes, you know, to dress maybe the way the, the pastor wanted them to dress. And finally, the pastor pulled Mr. Booth the side and said, you know, uh, we, we wanted new members of the church, but these are not the kind of people that we wanted. Well, that so struck and hurt the heart of, of General Booth that he began to say, well, I'm going to do something about it. Of course, I think he left that church not too happy, and he began the Great Salvation Army, and his whole goal was to get people saved and to lift their social life and to lift their, them out of their needs and to give them a new beginning. And so in this great thrust that he had, so was, Smith Wigglesworth began his ministry. He began his ministry going down the streets with a pony, and uh, since he could not talk so well, he was a stutterer in the first part of his life. Uh, later, when he received the Holy Spirit's baptism, he no longer had a stuttering ability. He talked just as fluent as I am now, and probably a little bit better. And, uh, but in the beginning, he was a stutterer. He was kind of uh, people uh, shy, didn't want to be around them, scared of them because of his stuttering uh, problem that he had. So what he would do, he would work in the children's ministry of the Salvation Army, and he would get a pony and walk down the street and put the kids on the back of it and say, if you come with me, I'll give you a ride to Sunday school, and when it's over, I'll give you a ride home. So that's the way Wigglesworth began his ministry in the Salvation Army, by getting little children to come to the special services they had for the children and bless them that way. It was in one of the Salvation Army meetings 
that Gypsy Smith's sister, uh, here's another person that we wish we had time to talk about, but his name is Gypsy Rodney Smith. He's a great uh, evangelist of Great Britain that actually comes from the, the Gypsy people of Europe, and he found uh, salvation and began to preach as a teenage boy and began to grow quite rapidly in the respect of Great Britain around the world, even while he was still a teenager. And uh, his sister was preaching in one of the Salvation Army meetings, and uh, Wigglesworth was attending, and he saw a young lady that had gone down to the altar that day to give her heart to God. And when he said, I looked at her, he said, I knew immediately that she was going to be my girl, meaning that was the woman that he was going to marry. And so that's exactly what happened. He married a beautiful woman that is named Polly, and they became wedded, and they lived happily uh, together all the days of their life. Uh, there was a few little uh, little problems that we we're going to talk about. I wouldn't call them major problems, but uh, Smith Wigglesworth was not, probably not the easiest man to live with, but I don't think his wife was the easiest woman to live with either. They both had those type of uh, aggressive personalities, and especially in their faith arena. But she was more the spokesperson. When she got saved and gave her heart to God, she became a preacher and get out there and preach in the pulpit, preach in the streets, run down the streets. She became a great Salvation Army preacher. You know, in those days, the Salvation Army preachers we sit on the street corner with a little band that had the trumpet player, the trombone player, the tambourine, and they'd be dressed in their Salvation Army outfits, and they would stand there on the street corner and get a little crowd, and then one guy would start preaching and getting people saved, and they would use the curb as the altar. They'd just kneel down next to the curb of the street, and they'd get down there and pray them through as they would call it and, and get them saved and then help them get involved in the Salvation Army. Then they would go down to another street corner and do the same thing. They'd pass out tracts and build little missions and feed the hungry. And so Wigglesworth's wife Polly would got all enthused and she became a great spokesperson for the Salvation Army, a great preacher. But Wigglesworth was a stutterer and she kept trying to push him forward and saying, honey, get out there and help me preach. And I don't think she did that out of a mischievous heart or a wrong motive. I just think that she wanted him up there with her and been a great team, she felt, uh, herself and, and Smith would be out preaching in the Salvation Army, getting people saved. And they would get together and believe God for 50 souls a week and many weeks they achieved those 50 souls, if not more. But finally, one time, she kept pushing Smith up. Come on, Smith, preach. Come on, get up here and preach. He'd get up to the pulpit and start trying to preach, and he would stutter, and he would stammer, and get real embarrassed, and he would uh, uh, conclude quickly or pass the, the pulpit over to his wife. And finally, one time, he just got so embarrassed. It was the, the time he couldn't take it no more, and he said to his wife, Don't you ever do that again. I'll never, never preach like that again. I'll work behind the scenes, but I cannot speak like that. I don't feel comfortable like that. I get embarrassed, and I don't like you pushing me. So she finally just kind of said, all right, that's the way it's going to be. He's going to work behind the scenes with me. He's going to take the pony up and down the streets. He's going to help him the, helping people in the streets get saved, and the altar worker he'd help out. But he didn't want to be in the pulpit because his stuttering problem uh, uh, caused him embarrassment and made him feel uncomfortable. But you know, all things change. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth was one of those men that he was a teachable spirit, a hungry soul. He didn't think he achieved everything, but uh, he had a whole lot more life coming to him. In, in their marriage, they had a, a beautiful family. We have a beautiful picture of Smith Wigglesworth and his wife and the children. And he had a daughter named Alice. He had sons named Seth, Harold, Ernest, and George. One of his sons died, though, while, they were still quite, while he was still quite young. And Wigglesworth, uh, you know, had to deal with the, the death of one of his boys. But the rest of his children uh, had the privilege of serving the Lord. All of the Wigglesworth's families, even many of the descendants today, are in still church work around the world. I had the privilege of being with his granddaughter in South Africa right before she passed away, about a year before she passed away. And I was able to say, well, uh, well, I'll tell you this. I wanted, I asked the Lord, when I go back to South Africa, uh, I, I want several things to happen. And one was, Lord, I'd like to meet the Wigglesworths that live in South Africa. They were once in the Congo, but because of the revolution and the Civil War, they moved down to South Africa, and that's where the descendants remained. Well, I was invited to speak my last Sunday night in a church, and uh, I found out that the granddaughter and the uh, son-in-law of Smith Wigglesworth was the pastors of that church. So I thought God had given me almost a, a present from heaven. And so I went there and I was so excited to meet them and they were able to sit down. And when the Sunday afternoon lunch that we had together, they invited all, the, all of their children. We had Wigglesworths everywhere. We had little baby Wigglesworths. We had a teenage Wigglesworths. We had Wigglesworths, probably about 30 to 40 different descendants of Wigglesworths all over the front yard eating. It was like Thanksgiving meal here in America. Everybody showed up. 
And uh, I came to find out that many of them knew the name of, of Smith, but didn't always know as much about him. But they were very wonderful people. And I remember asking their granddaughter, what, what do you know about, you know, the marriage and the family life of, 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 your, of your grandfather and grandmother? And she told me a couple of stories, and, and I want to relay them to you. She said, I remember as a little girl, I'd go to their home, and I would see them at Christmas time or special celebrations that uh, they would have a great meal. She said, I remember one time that Smith uh, grabbed my grandmother, and they were dancing together in the front room of their home to Christmas music. He was so happy and just doing this. He says, some people don't understand that my grandfather, though a great apostle of faith, as they call him, she said, uh, also had a natural side and had a very humorous side in the family life. And after his wife died, she remembered many times Smith would come over about the time that she began to put her daughter to bed and would sit there and sing to the little granddaughter and, and, and talk to her until she went to bed. Uh, he, he had a great love for the family. He was not one that, you know, ran from the family. He prayed for them. He was with them. He loved his wife. So the family life of Smith is a beautiful thing to follow and to be a part of. We find only one time in his life what I would say that Smith Wigglesworth uh, had a little of a backslidden condition. He got involved in the plumbing business. That's why he's known as the, the plumber who became a great preacher and a great healing evangelist. He got involved in the plumbing business and kind of got working too much and uh, kind of got cold in his soul, as it would say, and uh, began to pull back from going to the Salvation Army meetings and the church meetings. And his wife, though, would say, honey, you got to get back to church. You know how wives are. They start talking to their husbands, start trying to push them to get back where they belong. And he got so upset, and he said this in one of his writings, that uh, he took her, and they were in the back part of their home, and there was a back door, opened up the back door and put his wife on the back steps and locked the door behind her and uh, sat down. And she walked around the front of it laughing all the way, he said, and walked back to the front door, and he met her at the front door, and he started laughing too and said, you know, you're right. I got to get right. So he went on a couple of days of prayer and fasting to get his life back together. And that's really the only time you can ever find in the history and the persons that knew Wigglesworth where you could say he kind of fell away from the Lord, but it was probably only a few feet with a wife like Polly. You don't fall too far before she starts reacting. And obviously they did. And he was able to say, you know, I just got to get back. And he came back to the Lord the way that he should. He went to a healing meeting. And this is where some things begin to change in his life. As he was out traveling around doing different things, he went to a healing meeting and saw people being prayed for by the laying on of hands, and they were getting healed. Well, Wigglesworth was so enthused about this, the first time he saw it, he ran out the back door of that little small storefront uh, church uh, a building there that they had in Great Britain at that time and found the first sick person uh, on the street and said, you've got to come with me. And he didn't really ask him. He just kind of grabbed him and told him, you've got to come with me and took him back into the meeting and pushed him up there to the people that were praying and say, this person's sick, get him healed. And he ran back out again and found another person. So his introduction to the healing ministry was one of them enthusiasm. He said, if this is working, why should people walk down the streets not feeling good? Why should they be home suffering in pain and having premature early death? Let's get them in here and get these people uh, to pray for them and get them healed. So he got around the healing ministry and began to believe in it. Then he heard about people that began to speak in other tongues. There was a great man that had been touched by the Azusa Street Revival meetings named Alexander Body is the way you would say his name. He was the one that brought Pentecostalism to Great Britain and began to, to spread that great truth to the British people. He got around that meeting, and pretty soon he got baptized in the Holy Ghost too and began to speak with other tongues. He became empowered. Well, the first thing that happened to him when he got empowered by the Holy Spirit was his stuttering problem disappeared. Now, this is the great story that I love. He goes home and, and tells his wife, you know, I, I'd like to preach tomorrow. Well, she thought she'd got a miracle from God for sure that her husband Smith for a long time but not preached publicly, helped out of the meetings, the altar services, go up and down the street and help the children come to the, the special Sunday schools. And he would be all the, do all these wonderful things and very happy at it. And she just concluded inside of her that she'd be the pulpit person and he was happy there. So she just settled in with that kind of a position in life. So when he came in that day, and said, uh, you know, I, I'd like to preach tomorrow at the mission. I, I'd like to preach. Is that all right with you? And uh, she said, well, uh, sure, it's all right. She was so surprised. Uh, you wouldn't dare say no if it was been your long life's dream that your husband would preach with you. And he told you abruptly years ago, no. And now he's saying, I'd like to preach. Well, she thought she had a great miracle. Well, she did. She wasn't quite ready for all that was about to happen, but she soon received it. We well, got up to preach on the next day, 
after he asked for the permission and, and it was granted by his wife, sure, I'll, I'll step down and you take my place tomorrow. He got up and he began to preach, read a scripture and began to preach and he stuttered and he stammered like he had before, but this time he kept going. And it said that as he kept going, all of a sudden something came over him, his wife said, and his stuttering ability disappeared and he began to talk and to preach and was bold in his speech and there was no more stuttering. And throughout his entire life, from that day forward to the day that he went to home to be with the Lord, there was never no record and no story about him ever having a stuttering problem again. God healed him right there. When you get the Holy Spirit, something happens to you. Something changes. And so Smith Wigglesworth began his preaching ministry. He began to get up. Some of his sermons only last 10 minutes. I remember hearing one man say, I heard Wigglesworth preach. I said, well, what did he preach on? He said, well, he said one thing for 10 minutes. Walked back and forth across the platform, screaming at the top of his lungs, only believe, only believe. And at the end of 10 minutes of screaming that, he had a prayer line and started getting people healed. Uh, he was not your normal uh, conservative British minister. He wasn't even your normal American minister. He wasn't your normal Australian minister. He was a breed all by himself. He was a, a man that had stuttering problems that God healed, that had a boldness that people weren't quite ready for, but here it came. When he would pray for the sick, sometimes he would not be, as you heard a little bit earlier from Dr. Lester Summerall, uh, wasn't always just uh, laid hands on them uh, nicely. Uh, sometimes he was a little bit gruff, uh, maybe abrupt, and uh, his critics would say, why do you hit people? He said, I don't hit people. Uh, I hit the devil. The people just get in the way. And that's the way he answered them and went on about his business. Because when you got the results he had, you didn't need to spend much time talking to the critics. What I would like to do now, we have another beautiful segment from the man uh, that was my spiritual father called Dr. Lester Summerall. He traveled with a man by the name of Howard Carter who built the first Pentecostal Bible school in the world, which was in Great Britain. He traveled around the world with him. And when he came to Great Britain, he kept hearing, as you heard earlier in the first segment about about these stories of Wigglesworth and all that was going on. Uh, can you imagine? He hits people and sometimes kicks them a little bit, a little bit rough with them, but they get healed. I mean, if I'm sick and you want to hit me and I get healed, uh, I'll take that to get healed. It won't bother me. Maybe I soulless you won't prefer it, but I'd rather be healed than just uh, sit there and have you pray a nice little religious prayer that it gets no result. So Brother Summerall heard the, these stories and uh, he was out preaching in one of the conventions that Wigglesworth was uh, officiating. And I remember hearing the story that he was a young preacher and he'd get up and he'd start preaching. And all of a sudden in the middle of his message, uh, there was this big old hand on his shoulder and said, son, the Holy Ghost quit about 15 minutes ago. It'd be wise for you to do the same thing. And that's one of the introductions that he had with Smith Wigglesworth. But Brother Summerall had the privilege of going and being in his home. And he wants to relate to you uh, the first time he was able to see him and one of the last times he saw him before Wigglesworth went home to be with the Lord. The gentleman that I was traveling with was Dr. Howard Carter of London, England, uh, who had a Bible college there with the president of a Bible college that sent people all over the world to minister. It was a kind of a world a Bible training uh, institute. And he would tell me other things about this Smith Wigglesworth until finally I wanted to meet him more than anybody else. That there was an eagerness inside of me to hear and see Smith Wigglesworth. When we arrived in England, after we'd been together all through Australia and all through the Orient and all through Europe, we came across Siberia and Russia and went through Europe. We finally got to England and we got there the week before the national conference. And Dr. Howard Carter uh, was the uh, convener of the conference. He was the chairman of the conference. So he asked me to speak in the evening because I'm an evangelist. He asked, he asked Smith Wigglesworth to speak in the afternoon as he was a teacher. And, and so I was teamed up with him. The first week I was in England, I was teamed up with a man I wanted to meet. And, and uh, he, he wasn't easy, you know, he, he, he would sit like a statesman, even in, in church, just like this, listening intently to whoever was there speaking and, and so forth. And so uh, I arrived in the late afternoon, so he heard me first. So I preached that night and gave the altar call. Being a convention, there weren't many that got saved because most of the people were preachers and so forth. But I, I, I gave an evangelistic sermon, gave the altar call. When I was through and turned around on the platform, there was Smith Wigglesworth looking at me. He put his hand on my shoulder and said, Son, you need to come see me. Well, I had been, you know, called into the principal's office when I was in school, and I knew what it meant to face the principal and work on a problem, and that's what it sounded like, that he needed to see me to correct me. And I said, Yes, sir, when can I come? 
He said, anytime. He says, I live in Bradford. Here's my address and my telephone number. And says, you can come. I said, how often can I come? He said, you can come as often as you want to. Uh, these days, I'm at home. Now, I lived in England for two years. And within a week after that, I was on my way to Bradford. Now, anywhere you preached, you know, in the British Isles, you had to go through Bradford anyway. It was in the Midlands, right in the center. And so it was very convenient to, to buy a ticket to Bradford and then to buy a ticket to east or west or north or wherever I wanted to go. It was so easy to do that. And, and so I went to see him. I found his house and, uh, and, and, and I hit the, the, the doorbell, you know, the door locker, knocker. They didn't have an electric doorbell. It's one of those ancient things that you uh, take a piece of metal and hit it against a piece of metal, you know, uh, a knocker. And so I knocked on that thing and then stood up and waited for him. Now, if you had seen me then, you would have laughed. Because by this time, uh, with the British people, I, I looked like them. And, and I talked like them somewhat. And I had on a bowler hat. If you don't know what a bowler hat is, it's a Charlie Chaplin hat. And, and I had on, I had, had on a, 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 a black jacket and, and striped trousers and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a blue, dark blue top coat that came just above my knees. And I had an umbrella on, on one arm and I had a newspaper on the other arm and my briefcase in my hand, my Bible case. So there I stood, you know, and Smith Wigglesworth opened the door and glared at me. He didn't say good morning. He didn't say, how do you do? He said, what's under your arm? That means what is under your arm. I, this, this side was an umbrella on my arm, and the other side was a morning newspaper under my arm. I said, the morning newspaper, sir. He said, throw it away. Throw it away. You can't come in here. You can't come in here. <laughs> and, and I said, yes, sir. So I took it and stuck it in the bushes and stood back up to see if there's something else, you know. And, and uh, he looked me over and said, come in. So I came in. He took my coat. We went into his living room, which was the first room over to the right. And, and I had a, he had a coal fire on and it was very cozy. And uh, rather than asking me where I came from, where I was going, he said, I was just reading. <laughs> and he read a half an hour from the Bible. And then he said, let's pray. He knelt down and prayed for another half hour, but he laid hands on me and he prayed and said, God bless him. God bless him. <laughs> I, I was really glad when he got through, you know. And he said, I want to read you some more. So he read the Bible for another half hour. And then he said, let's pray again. And so we, we got down and we, we prayed again. And I said, Lord, what did I get into here? What did I get into? You know? And, and so uh, about that time, his beautiful daughter, Alice, that we were telling you about, uh, she had prepared a beautiful uh, a luncheon. And so she called us uh, to lunch, Yorkshire pudding and, and, and roast beef and, and that beautiful gravy that they put on it there. It, it was something. And, and, and peas that you pick up on the back of your fork rather than the front. And, and so we had a, a delicious lunch. And when he got through, uh, he just put his napkin on the table and said, uh, uh, come back again and walked away. His daughter explained that he had gone to get some rest. And so I, I, I thought that was a signal to leave. And so I asked for my coat and I left. Before I'd walked a block, I said, you know, I got something there. I, I, I'm different. I, I got something. I received a blessing. I, I received an anointing. Something good happened to me in that place. I said, I, I'll come back again. And so about 10 days later, I went back. Oh, yes, I, I, I had on my little, little dark blue uh, raincoat, and, and I had my umbrella, uh, and my bowler hat, but I didn't have any newspaper. He, uh, when he saw a newspaper, he said, I don't permit those lies into my house. He says, in my house, there's only truth, and that's full of lies. Leave it outside. And so I just obeyed and, and did what he told me to do. And I went 10 days later, and then I went again two weeks later. Then I went again two weeks later. I continued to go to his house. I continued listen to him read the word and listen to him pray and hear him tell of the mighty miracles, the mighty miracles that God 
had done for him around the world. And my faith began to mount up, to mount up, you know, strong. My faith began to mount up in, in the presence of this man. We became good friends. When, when he had a convention, he would ask me to speak, to be a speaker in his personal convention and, and over in the city of Preston. And I, I, I accepted it. I was very delighted for that. We would meet in other conferences, and then I would go and see him. Now, in all the two years that we were having this fellowship, I, 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 never, I never met another visitor at his house, and not, not one time. So they weren't standing in a long line to get Smith Wigglesworth's faith. And there may be those that admire him today, but I didn't see you there uh, when, when, when I was there. And, and so uh, they weren't seeking after Smith Wigglesworth at that time. But I was an American and, and a young man, and I wanted what this older man had. He intrigued me. He, his bluntness intrigued me, and his depth of sweetness, you might say. It was like a well of water springing up, and it was so delicious until I would come and drink again and again and again. And so we had some very precious times of fellowship uh, with, with Smith Wigglesworth. Two things I'd like to, to, to tell you about it. One is that I was in England when the war broke out uh, in, in 1939, living there. I had preached all over the continent. We, we, we knew what was coming. Everybody knew what was coming. And I preached in Germany uh, with, with, with Hitler's uh, Gestapo men in every meeting that I spoke in and so forth. And so uh, we were very conversant to Europe. It, it was, the, it was the, the cockpit of the world and about to explode. And it did explode in, in 39. And I was there, and Hitler's armies were, were, were moving out. And they went through Belgium and through Holland and into France. And the British government sent a special agent to my, to my room in London. I was living at the Bible school. And said, we will be next and we will have to send you out of the country. This is now a war zone, and, and you are a visitor here. You'll have to leave. So I was told by the British government that I would have to leave uh, England. And so I had to go tell some friends, and one of them was, was Smith Wigglesworth. So I, I went up to his home again, and now we were old friends. We had a lot to talk about. He had blessed me in so many ways. He had discussed the Word of God with me in, in, in so many wonderful sessions together uh, until I was always eager to get there, and he seemed eager for me to come. Because at that time, I would be 25 or 26, and he would be maybe 85, you see? And, and that, that, is a, that is a difference. It's like an Abraham and an Isaac, you see? It's, it's like a Paul and a Timothy. And so I broke the news to him. I said, uh, Brother Wigglesworth, I, I will not be seeing you now. I have to leave because of the war. And the government has told me they've given me so many days to get out of the country. And, and so I will be going back to America and on to other countries to preach the gospel. And so the fellowship, the fellowship with you has, has been very rare. Uh, only a person like Howard Carter or a person like Donald G. has, has blessed me equal to blessing that I've received from you. And I humbly thank the Lord and thank you for giving me so much of your time and, and letting me hear you talk to God in your prayers and to hear you read the living Word of God and, and how it comes alive within you. I am so grateful and I'm so thankful. And, and now I will have to leave. He, he stood up uh, on his feet and tears began to flow down his face. Now, he looked like what you'd call, you know, a Philadelphia lawyer or a Boston banker between the two. Never a hair out of shape, so groomed so perfectly and so beautifully. He was a very un unusual person. And he, he stood up there like a general, you know, and he says, I want to bless you. And I said, yes, sir. He had done that a lot of times. And he laid his hand over on me and pulled me close to him. And I let my head go in closer to him. And, and from his eyes, uh, tears came and ran down his face and dropped off 
onto my forehead and ran down my face. And he, as he cried, says, Oh God, God, let all of the faith that is within my heart be in his heart. And, and, and let the knowledge of God that resides in me also reside in him. And that all the gifts of the Spirit that function in my ministry, let them function in, in his life. I, I just stood there weeping, and he stood there praying and, and, and weeping, holding me in an embrace uh, to him. And I felt the holy anointing of the Most High God as it, as it flowed from him into me. Now, I have been blessed by a, a number of great men, and I'm so thankful for it. To, to go around the world when I was so young and to meet the great men of the whole world and a hundred nations of the world, you know, was a real honor. And so I appreciated it so much. And, and as he broke the embrace, he said, you will be blessed, and faith will reside within you, and you will do unusual things. I, I presume it was a kind of a prophecy. And, and then he said, I wish to tell you something. And I said, yes. Oh, he says, I see it. His eyes were burning like Elijah's eyes when he saw the chariot of the Most High. His, his face, his face was so strong as he was looking at me and saying, I see it. And I said, what do you see? He said, I see revival coming to planet Earth. He says, I see revival coming to planet Earth. Maybe as, as never, never before, as never before, I, I see revival coming. He says, it would be untold numbers, an untold, uncounted multitudes that will be saved, that no man will say so many, so many, because nobody will be able to count those that will come to Jesus. And, and I, I just stood there, and he was prophesying and seeing a vision, because he said, I, I see it, I see it. He said, the dead will be raised. He said, the arthritic will be healed. He said, cancer will be healed. And, and he began to tell me of the mighty things that no disease would be able to stand before God's people, and that it would be a worldwide situation, not local, but it would be a worldwide thrust of God's power and thrust of God's anointing upon mankind. And, and I was listening so intently to it. And then he, he opened his eyes and looked at me, and he said, uh, I will not see it, but you shall see it. And that was the end of it. You shall see it. There was another great man by the name of David Duplessis that had the opportunities of being with Smith Wigglesworth. He also gave that young man a prophecy that there would come a time when there would be great signs and wonders as a revival. Then there would come a time of a great teaching of the Word. Then there will come a great revival at the end of the time when both signs and wonders and the teaching will combine together. And I believe that we're living in the beginnings or the middle of this particular prophecy that Wigglesworth gave. So I hope that encourages our heart to know that we are in a great thrust. Sometimes you don't know you're in a great move until it's over or until you're removed from it. So let's we have the ability to recognize it when we're in it and utilize what's come from heaven to bless the people of the earth with. I want to take a few moments here to share some other stories of miracles and things that Wigglesworth uh, has done throughout his life that has inspired me or helped me and encouraged other people. I think sometimes the Wigglesworth stories are so humorous and so uh, intriguing. I remember hearing about a man that uh, was in Wigglesworth's meeting when he was preaching in Texas on one of his American tours, and every night he prays for the sick, of course, has a message normally, then he have a prayer line, and he'd pray for them individually. And he said, I only pray for people once, because if I pray for you twice, that means it's unbelief. That's how Wigglesworth saw it. So the pastor said he was helping people up on the platform and Wigglesworth was praying for them and some were getting healed instantly. Others uh, didn't get their instant healing. Maybe they got it on their way home. But that first night there were some great miracles and there was a certain man that was kind of an influential man, a man that dressed well, had a little bit of means and uh, came to the prayer line and got, prayer for, got prayed for. Came back the second night, got in the prayer line again. And uh, the pastor knew what Wigglesworth's thoughts were. 
He had heard what Wigglesworth had said the night before, I only pray for you once. If I pray for you twice, it's unbelief and you won't get healed. And so he couldn't quite tell the man not to get in the prayer line. That's the pastor's heart coming out. And so the man got in front of Wigglesworth and Wigglesworth goes, uh, uh, didn't I pray for you last night? And the man goes, yes, sir, but I didn't receive. He said, you're full of unbelief. Get off my platform and pushed him off the stairs. And the pastor had to kind of catch him and take him down the staircase. He said, I said once, and that's faith. Twice, it's unbelief. Uh, that man won't get healed. Don't be back in my prayer line no more. Uh, I, I have to say, I don't know if I have the boldness to do that yet, but i tell you one thing. Uh, Wigglesworth wasn't afraid. He knew where he stood and how he operated. Brother Summerall told me a story. I asked him one time when he was preaching at my church. I said, uh, Dr. Summerall, what was the most humorous thing you ever saw Wigglesworth do? You talk about the blessing that we heard about just a few moments ago in uh, the clip that we found for you. But I said, what was a humorous thing that you've ever seen Wigglesworth do? And he starts laughing before he even tells the story. He said, well, I'll tell you. He says, uh, he and I was in Wales uh, holding a convention for the people, and uh, they had prepared a great meal. And he said, the Welsh people are great singing people. And Brother Summerall said they prepared uh, and roasted a, 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 a pig for us and prepared a great meal and laid it out and had it on the table. He finished the service. It's time for all of the preachers and the church members to, to have lunch. And so they asked Brother Wigglesworth to have the honor to bless the, the lunch meal that day. And so Brother Wigglesworth said, yes, he would love to pray for the, for the meal and bless the food. So everybody closed their eyes. And they bowed their heads, and Wigglesworth began to pray and said, uh, Lord, if you can bless what you've cursed, well, then bless this stinking pig. Amen. And he said, you should have seen the reaction of all the Welsh people who prepared that meal, and the pastors didn't know whether they should eat it or leave it alone. Uh, and he said, that was the most humorous thing that he ever saw Brother Wigglesworth do. Wigglesworth was accredited to raising 23 people from the dead. One Pentecostal historian in Great Britain said he has documented 23 cases where Smith Wigglesworth had raised somebody who had died back to life again. One of the most amazing stories that I've found to, to be true is the person that he raised from the dead early in his ministry. He was called into the situation and to pray for the person. When he got there, the person had already died. The family, of course, had been crying, and the, grief, uh, the grieving of the soul had begun, and they were all upset that the loved one had died. Wigglesworth picked the person up out of the bed, and uh, they had, the, thank God, they still had their night clothes on, picked the person up out of the bed, put them up against the wall, and said, I command you to live, and uh, let go of the person, and that person dropped to the floor. He picked them up from the floor, shoved them up against the wall again and screamed, I command life to come back into you and let go of them, drop to the floor again. So he grabbed them the third time and put them up against the wall and said, I, I command you to live and dropped them and went back to the floor. And this time when they hit the floor, a few moments went by and the eyes began to open. The person stood up and walked off. Uh, I don't know if we have the, the faith to, to go through one uh, up against the wall, let known three times before the person came back to life again. Those are some of the most amazing things I've ever heard uh, about any preacher, of how Wigglesworth raised the dead. There's also the story one time about the parents that brought a small child who had lame feet, who could not stand. The feet were kind of turned in, and uh, the baby, I guess, was not uh, in this type of, but probably like maybe two or three years old, should be able to stand a little bit. And uh, Wigglesworth asked, what's wrong with the child? And they said, well, the feet are deformed and it's lame. It cannot walk. He said, uh, place the baby there on the, on, on the floor. And uh, I, I wouldn't believe this unless I've had to uh, uh, talk to eyewitnesses who saw this. Wigglesworth told the parents to put the baby on the, uh, the floor of the platform. And so Wigglesworth told the parents to take a step back. And he uh, kicked the baby, booted the baby out into the, into the audience. And you can imagine the mother's heart goes, the father's heart goes, the crowd gasps. But the baby, the eyewitness said, landed on two feet, normal, and took off running. Uh, I hope I could find faith to boot a little baby like that out into the aisle of a congregation. And by the time it hits the floor, the feet are normal and straight. It hits the floor and takes off running. Uh, those are some amazing stories, and they're just not Christian folklore. These are people that I've talked to that were eyewitnesses to these things. Uh, I'm willing to see it myself. I'm willing to even do it myself as what the Lord wants, but I tell you, that takes faith to do that. Wigglesworth also tells a story that one time he was on a train because, you know, in Great Britain, the rail system is still a great means of travel, even today. 
and he was sitting on the train, and he believed that you carried the presence of God, and what you carried can convict men as well as heal people of their sicknesses. So he was sitting there, uh, minding his own business as he was traveling to his next uh, place to preach, and all of a sudden, the man behind him jumped up and said, man, you convict me of being in sin. And he says, what, what, what's wrong with you? And the little said, well, it's just time for you to repent and get, and get right. So right there on the train, they knelt down in front of everybody, and Wigglesworth helped pray that man to salvation. He was at another train station waiting for a train to come, and uh, he had noticed that this little uh, lady uh, had her, you know how the little ladies are in Great Britain, their little purses and their umbrellas and things, had been playing with a dog who seemed to have been lost and, and not been with its master. And the train was coming, and the lady said, uh, well, you've got, to, uh, you, you've got to go home now. And uh, so the dog just kept coming, you know, and finally it was time to board the train, and the lady stomped her foot and said, get out of here. And Wigglesworth screamed, that's what you should do to the devil, and got on the train. So every place he went, he had a personality, and he wasn't scared to talk. I'm about to show you something that I'm very excited that we have found. It is the only uh, film footage of Smith Wigglesworth. We have no voice recordings of him as of yet. But we do have some film footage of him that we found from a, an elderly lady that worked in Amy C. McPherson's bookstore that I talked to years ago. And she said, my father uh, has some films of him that I've got now. I had to wait years to get this. But uh, I'm going to have uh, our uh, director here roll the tape, and I'm going to talk you through it since there is not uh, any voice to it. But what you're seeing here is the man, uh, that's Wigglesworth there that you see with his hat that, we, that Summerall talked about. And these are just, you know, family home shots of him out in the, the park there where he lived in Bradford. And uh, just kind of get a glimpse of him as he walks through the garden, as he's there with the preacher from the Four Square Church from Los Angeles, uh, the lady who gave me the film's father there. There they are again walking. I was just so excited to have some besides just a still picture. Uh, I wish we had a voice recording, but we don't have that. But at least we have this to show it to you and uh, love to have been in the conversation that the two preachers were having there. There again, walking through the park in Bradford, just posing. He's going to kiss her here in a moment. The countryside. And then we're going to have him walking across the bridge there. I guess the man got Brother Wigglesworth to uh, walk out and say, let me take some films of you. And so he's trying to give us a little bit of entertainment here. This is him and his, with his car at a gas station back in the, in the late 40s. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. This is actually where he lived at 70 Victor Road in Bradford, England. That's the door that Brother Summerall walked up to, knocked on it, and uh, Wigglesworth asked him, what's under your arm? And Brother Summerall took the newspaper, put it under the bushes there. Today, uh, that home is owned by a family of Muslims that uh, it is now in a Muslim community there in Bradford. When I went there years ago and uh, took a tour group that I take sometimes to go see all the, the great sites of Christian history in Great Britain, we went there and the Muslims uh, don't even know what they're living in. It's sad to say that his front room is where they sell liquor today. I hope somebody listening to me will go by the house and bring it back to some type of Christian influence, maybe make a little prayer chapel. I don't think uh, uh, Allah belongs in that house, but we're very glad to be able to show that to you. It's one of our I say one of my best finds I have, uh, some people collect uh, baseball cards. I hunt Pentecostal history and things like this so I can be able to share with you in the future generations are the foundations on which we stand of great men in faith who subdued kingdoms and brought righteousness and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of the devouring spirits in their generation that blesses us today. Brother Wigglesworth had some wonderful words I'd like to quote in our last few moments of, of this particular lecture. He said, if the Spirit does not move me, I'll move the Spirit. He was talking there about his faith. If the Spirit is not moving, well, then he's going to get his faith going, and that's going to move him on to where uh, we need to be in that service. He says, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you should never say, I can't. Because when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and especially when he sent the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm only moved by what I believe. He said, fear looks, but faith jumps. 
He said, I'd rather have men on my platform not filled with the Holy Ghost but hungry for God than a man who has received the Holy Ghost and become satisfied with his experience. He said to his critics, you know, everybody has some critics. He said to his critics, why don't you put down your umbrellas of prejudice and come on in and enjoy the latter rain that belongs to you and I. So it's so interesting that every great man and woman of God has somebody that wants to oppose them. He said, I'd rather die trusting God than live a life of unbelief. He said on the ministry of healing, he said, I can see a day coming when it'll be hard to get people healed because there's so many other remedies by which people can put their trust and faith in. I, I think we're kind of there right now. Brother Wigglesworth died in 1947, the month of March. Brother Summerall personally told me the story of how he died. He was going to the funeral of a friend. And he was walking up the stairs uh, of the chapel there where they were going to have the, the funeral service, the memorial service. And a lady uh, that he knew, they had prayed for her mother. He asked, well, how is your, your mother doing? And the girl kind of abruptly said, well, she's doing worse than you prayed for her and, and walked on. And Brother Sermon said it probably hurt his, hurt his heart and soul to have someone so young be so abrupt to him and what he said. But he walked into the building and they invited him back into the minister's room as we would call it today in our, in our generation. And he was back there just discussing some things about the ministry and asking questions, making just a little conversation. And the man that was in the room with him had turned his back to do some things over this side of the room on a table. And when he turned back around, Brother Sumrall said that Wigglesworth had already gone to be with the Lord. Wigglesworth had asked God at the age of 72 for 15 more years, and God granted him uh, those 15 more years and lived a full life. He never had many uh, types of bouts with sin or troubles along those lines that maybe others have had. He lived a good life, a good strong moral life. He brought, uh, he brought to Australia and New Zealand the Pentecostal message when he was down there preaching with them. The people had heard that when you pray with Wigglesworth, you can't stay in the same room with him. Well, when he got to the next place, there was a preacher who said, well, I won't be driven out because of the way a man prays. They said, well, you don't understand. It's not because of how he prays. It's what shows up when he prays. And so he was praying with the minister before the service. And, of course, the man who said, I won't be driven out was there. And the, and the story goes, as Wigglesworth began to pray and ask God to come and bless the people and heal the people, that one by one the ministers couldn't stand the presence of God that came as he prayed. And the man who said, I won't leave, kept trying to stay there. And finally, he crawled out of the room. And this is a story that goes around New Zealand to the day that when Wigglesworth prayed in New Zealand, the man that said, I won't leave, had to crawl out of the room. I believe he had that tangible presence of God. Sometimes we have it come on us and live, but I think he carried it more as an everyday part of his life than what we can imagine. Wigglesworth also had many books written about him. They had uh, his life story that was written by Stanley Frotsam, which is the great story of his life. And I encourage you to get that. One thing I'd like to mention to you that I, that I have prepared in our last moment here is I collected for over 10 years all of his unpublished sermons and teachings. And uh, we have it in, a, in this book called The Wigglesworth Collection, His Life Teachings, 850 pages of, uh, of his sermons. And I didn't edit them to death. However he spoke them, that's the way I left them in there. I left in the tongues, the interpretations, the prophecies, everything. He would sing songs sometimes right in the middle of his service, and we would leave uh, those songs in there for you too. People have been blessed by his teachings, so I put this in this big, nice hardback. And if you'd like to get this, I'm sure at the end you can write me or call me or go to your local bookstore and get them. And we want you to uh, encourage you to get them and enjoy them. I've read them, enjoyed them, and they still inspire my faith, cause me to be uplifted. Something we're just doing too is we just found his answers and questions to Bible college students where people can hear him answer questions that people ask of him as Bible college students. What can we learn from Wigglesworth? Have strong faith, only believe, and never doubt. We want you every week to come back and be with us. We want you to know that we're here to bless you. We're here to help change you. We're here to help you make you an end-time warrior that's not afraid of anything, that's ready to invade everything and do what God's called us to do in these last days. Please, when you write, send your prayer request in. Also, you may want to know more information about the Bible School that we have in Southern California. So make sure you say, send me the Bible School information or look it up on the website and have all the information about it. Or if you're in Southern California, you're flying through Los Angeles, we're about an hour south of Los Angeles. 
Angeles Airport in the city called Irvine. We'd love to have you on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night, or you can just come any time of the week and come in and visit the Bible School and sit in some of the classes. Also, if you want more information about where I may be speaking, I may be in your area and you may not know it, so make sure you look it up on the website or when you're requesting the tape series here and the special offer with the book, make sure you say, send me Robert's itinerary, or just call and we'll tell you where I'll be and we'll hope to see you there. We hope to see you next week as well, too. Have a wonderful day.